Okay, hi everybody. So this is the lecture on Iris Marion Young's Five Faces of Oppression. I'm the second article that we're reading by Iris Marion Young after throwing like a girl. Um, to get started, I just wanted to remind us of some things we've already seen a fair amount of um, in, the in the first unit of this course where we talked about um, the sort of oppressive structure that we first saw in Simone de Beauvoir and then we saw playing out in some of the other authors we read where the man is considered the neutral representative of humanity, right? The one or the subject, and the woman is cast as um, other, right? Um, with de Beauvoir, we saw that um, mostly focused on men and women, though there were examples from other categories like um, race and class. Um, but in this, um, week. We're going to um, be thinking about what is called intersectionality. I'll talk a bit more about that in the next lecture, um, where we're going to be considering a lot more categories of identity besides gender, right? Class, race, sexual orientation, ability, and things like that, right? Um, so what we'll do, what we'll see happening in some of the things we read is that um, it's not just the man that's considered the one or the neutral, but also um, the white man, the straight man, the cisgendered man, the rich or middle-class man, the able-bodied man, and the young or middle-aged man, right? So when we think about what a person is, um, a lot of people might think that their placeholder for that would be um, a male person who had all these other qualities. They probably wouldn't be thinking about, say, um, a Syrian refugee or um, a black lesbian or you know, a, a poor person in an old age home or whatever. They'd be thinking about the sort of public face of humanity as this sort of well-off, able, probably white man, right? So that becomes the normal representative of humanity and people who don't fit that for whatever reason, and there might be more than one reason, right? Get cast as other, right? Um, and so while everyone is in fact a full-fledged human subject, huge segments of the population get um, cast into this othered position, and sometimes for multiple reasons, right? Um, and so what we're gonna do this week is we're gonna talk further about the specific forms or what Iris Marion Young calls the faces that oppression can take in contemporary society. And so we'll expand our discussion of oppression to the experiences and situations of all oppressed groups, not just women, right? Working people, um, racial and ethnic groups, gays and lesbians, physically and mentally disabled people, old people, and so on, right? And doing this will allow us to develop a further picture of oppression in general and of the oppression of women in particular, because of course there are poor women, black women, lesbian women, disabled women, old women, and so forth, right? Um, okay, so let's get into Young's argument. What is oppression? Um, so you'll see this mainly on pages 40 to 42, this particular discussion. Now, when you think of oppression, it's you might likely think of something um, very extreme, something like overt tyranny or domination. You might think of examples like slavery in the United States, apartheid in South Africa, um, the Hebrews being oppressed in Egypt, um, the Algerians being oppressed by the French in Algeria, um, these sort of extreme obvious examples are the Jews being oppressed by the Germans in Nazi Germany, and so on, right? In these situations, oppression is naked and obvious. There's really um, no doubt about it, right, That's that we're, what we're looking at. And while these are indeed examples of oppression, dramatic examples of oppression, oppression can be a lot more sneaky and subtle than in these naked, obvious situations. And that's what Young really wants to explore here. According to Young, we should understand oppression not only as the willful domination of one group by another group, but as something that is structural and that often goes unnoticed. So I'll read you a quote from Young. This is on page 41. She says the following. Oppression designates the disadvantage and injustice some people suffer, not because a tyrannical power coerces them, but because of the everyday practices of a well-intentioned liberal society. 
In this new left usage, the tyranny of a ruling group over another, as in South Africa, must certainly be called oppressive. But oppression is also, also refers to the syst systematic constraints on groups that are not necessarily the result of the intentions of a tyrant. Oppression in this sense is structural rather than the result of a few people's choices or policies. So there's a few key words there I want you to really notice. Um, one is if oppression is structural, it doesn't just rely on the self-conscious choices of individuals, like say Hitler and Nazi Germany, right? Who self-consciously was anti-Semitic and wanted to destroy the Jewish people, right? In this new, more subtle concept of oppression, um, no one needs to be choosing it, right? It can happen anyway. Um, second, um, this kind of oppression, we can see at play in what Young calls a well-intentioned liberal society, such as the United States, right? Where we might want people, and we want to think of ourselves as um, affording equal rights to all, all different people, right? We don't um, typically think of a uh, um, democracy like the United States as overtly oppressive of a certain group and so on. And yet, Young argues, oppression can still happen in these context, contexts, even if our, you know, our intentions are good. Right, or even if the liberal white majority's intentions are good, right? Because oppression takes a, a more structural and therefore a more sneaky form, right? And third, you can notice, um, she says, it doesn't have to be the result of policies. Of course, there are policies in lots of places, including the United States that we might identify as oppressive. But here we could say, even if the policies said on paper, formally, everyone is equal, oppression could still be going on. That's what we need to figure out, how that works, right? And so in this understanding, even in countries where all citizens are for the most part formally equal in the eyes of the law, oppression is at work in various ways and may in some ways be more insidious because it is less obvious, less visible, more easily denied, right? Young also argues that in this structural conception of oppression, we need to shift our focus from thinking about an oppress, oppressor group and a, an oppressed group and start thinking about a privileged group and an oppressed group. And if you think about the difference between calling someone an oppressor and calling someone privileged or calling a group an oppressor or a group privileged, we can see that a privileged group might not think of themselves as oppressors at all, and they might have the best of intentions, and yet they're still privileging from, they're still the beneficiaries of certain kinds of structural oppressive arrangements that are going on in society. And so they could have the best intentions in the world and yet still be privileged within this system, right? Because this is less a matter of focusing on people's individual attentions, intentions and more a manner of focusing on their place in a, in a system that they might not understand, they might not have created, and yet they're living in and perpetuating, right? Um, and so even if someone denies, say, being racist, and they might not have thought a racist thought in their life, they might still be privileging from racial inequality, right? And so we're gonna shift our attention from the perspectives of certain individuals who might criticize towards privileged and oppressed groups and try to look at the dynamics of that. Okay, um, so I've been using the word group a lot because um, that's, that's a big focus of Young's here, that um, it's groups, it's not individuals that are perpetuating these unequal and oppressive systems that can go on even in well-intentioned liberal societies. And so, um, we need to think about what a group is. Um, this is an important um, discussion in, in the essay. You'll find it on pages 42 to 48. Okay. Um, so think to yourself for a second. What are, what are some of the groups to which you belong? Um, you might say something like, we're students. That would be a group. You might say something like, we're Americans, if you are an American, that would be a group. You might say something like, we're women, if you're women, or we're men, if we're men, or we're members of the trans community, if you're trans, or um, we're millennials, if you're a millennial, or we're African-Americans, if you're um, Black and from the United States. 
those are some examples. Other examples, um, your EMU students, that's a group. Um, maybe you're part of some kind of club um, based on your um, political appointments or your hobbies. Say you're part of a bird watching club, just to um, choose a, a kind of random example. Anyway, these are all lists, you know, examples of groups. Um, what makes them groups? So this is, this is the kind of philosophical argument that Young now takes us through. She is going to introduce us to two candidate answers that um, people have advanced in social and political philosophy, um, political science, and, and, and things like that, um, that try to define what do we mean by group when we say group. I just named a bunch of examples, but what's the definition? What makes a group a group? So she's going to give us two candidate answers, and then she's going to give us her answer. So the two candidate answers um, are that first, the aggregate model of groups, and second, the association model of groups. So I want to um, um, give you, I'll explain those things to you, um, maybe put some of our examples into the list, um, and then I'll, I'll move on to what Young thinks a group is. So group is an aggregate. Um, on page 43, Young says, by this definition, any classification of persons according to some attribute constitute a group. So say um, everyone who um, has dark skin is considered an African-American. Or how about everyone who has blue eyes is part of the blue eyes group. Or how about everyone who owns a 2005 Toyota Corolla is part of the, that a group of all the people that own a 2005 Toyota Corolla um, or whatever, right? Or how about all people, um, actually I'll leave that. Those are good enough examples. Um, say skin color, eye color, what kind of car you own. Um, you have something in common there for your part of a group. Is this a satisfying definition? Um, Young thinks no, and the reason she gives is the following. Um, by this definition, there aren't really stable groups in a meaningful sense, just random classifications. We could make groups out of anyone that shared any common attribute, right? Already the eye color is a bit random. We don't really think of blue-eyed groups, even though, of course, there are people with blue eyes and people without blue eyes, but that seems kind of like a random way to group people. Or by what kind of car we have, unless you're an enthusiast of 2005 Toyota Corollas, um, probably you don't feel anything particularly in common with other people who own 2005 Toyota Corollas, right? That'd be a random way to class people. Um, it's arbitrary, right? Um, another problem with it um, that Young identifies is that um, it doesn't necessarily work to um, identify meaningful group experiences. So take the skin color example. Um, there are many, there's a big spectrum of skin color shades, right? And so um, people with darker skin, A could be um, say of Indian origin and not um, be an African-American at all. Or there might be someone with quite light skin who is an African-American by descent and who identifies as an African-American. And so the, the um, classification can get really messy. It might not actually work to, um, to properly classify people in the groups to which they actually feel themselves to belong, right? So those are two, two main reasons. It's arbitrary. You can make a group out of any old random thing, or it doesn't actually work due to the variation among um, members of actual groups. So this seems like this, this definition won't work. Um, Okay, maybe a group then is an association. This is the second candidate that, that Young gives us. Now, what is an association? Um, she says this on page 44. By an association, I mean a formally organized institution like a club, corporation, political party, church, college, or union. So here we can go back to some of the examples I said before about you know, guessing at some of the groups that you might all belong to or, or things I know you all belong to, like I know your EMU students. Um, you might be visiting EMU students, but at least right now in the, this class, you're all EMU students. You're all members of um, Phil WGST 226 Feminist Theory, right? Um, this would be an example of an association. 
right? Why? Because you've chosen to belong to some group, at least for the time being, right? And you could have chosen not to, or you could have chosen something else, right? Um, so it's usually, she says, voluntary membership, right? Definitely, if you're in a you know, bird watching club, that would be an example of an association. You explicitly chose it of your own free will, right? You can think of lots of other examples. Um, is this a satisfying definition? So we don't want a random classification, that's the aggregate model. So maybe a voluntary association. You say, if you identify as part of that group, if you chose that group, you were in that group. Is this a satisfying definition of group? Um, in order to show you why Young thinks it is not, consider the difference between, say, being an African American and being a member of a bird watching club. What are some of the differences that you might notice? Um, there's a number of things to say here. I can identify a few. One, um, you didn't choose to be an African American. You were born that way. You did choose to be a member of a bird watching club, right? And so to say being an African American is a matter of voluntary membership in an association seems wrong, right? And if you chose to leave, you couldn't. Not really, right? Um, so that seems like at least one basic reason um, that an association model isn't um, good, a good de um, definition of lots of kind of groups that matter to us. You didn't choose to be a woman. You didn't choose to be 20 years old in 2020, right? Um, these, so it, you didn't choose to be a millennial, right? There's all sorts of groups you belong to that you did not choose and that you cannot voluntarily leave, voluntarily leave, right? And so to call a group an association, even though we can recognize some groups or associations like the bird watching club, it doesn't seem like a lot of our group identities really are associations, right? In these cases, like being an African-American or being a woman or being a millennial, it's not the case that you're first an individual and then you go select a group to join, right? Rather, it's the opposite. Who you are as an individual is in many ways inseparable from the group or the groups of which you are a part, right? You're not first you and then you go decide to be black. Right? You're not first you and then you decide to be 20 years old. Right? Who you are is a black 20 year old. I mean, you're lots of things, you're not just that. Right? But that's an integral part of your identity. It formed who you are as an individual in lots of ways rather than you as an individual going and selecting those things. Right? So that's why on page 45, Young says, individuals don't constitute groups, groups constitute individuals. Groups inform our identity. Okay, so now let's get to Young's own definition. And this I wanna sum up is, we wanna understand group as a sense of identity, right? But not a sense of identity that you arbitrarily chose one day, not a sense of identity based on random classification, but a sense of a meaningful identity of your own that you did not necessarily choose. How should we understand this sense of identity? Young says on page 46, she introduces this important concept um, that she calls, following the philosopher Martin Heidegger, thrownness. You think about, that's a kind of funny word. That's a funny translation of a German word, actually, but thrownness. Um, being always already thrown into a group, finding oneself part of a group from before you can remember. Right? Now, this doesn't determine who you will be or what you will do. But who you will be and what you will do will always to an extent respond to the group affiliations into which you are thrown. Right? Um, so this, Young thinks, is how we should understand being a millennial or being a woman or being black, right? Is um, we've always already been um, part of a generation um, part of a gender, right? Um, though that can be complicated. Um, part of a race, right? Um, and other things like that that we can think of, right? Or say um, being born into a poor working class family. That's not something you chose. It will always already have 
inform your identity. Even if you go on and become rich, right? It will never be the case that you didn't grow up as a working class or poor person and that that shaped who you were, right? Even if you can um, change your situation, right? It doesn't determine you, but you will um, always be someone who grew up in that kind of way. And that will shape how you relate to money, to your own richness, if you get rich and so on, right? Tons and tons of novels and films about this kind of thing around class mobility and so on, right? And, and how we don't just become part of another class unproblematically usually, right? Who our backgrounds shape who we are and that will always be the case, even though we might make very different decisions and have different kinds of things happen to us. So this is what Young means by thrownness, right? Um, here's another important point. She doesn't use this word, but I think it works well. The, the word is interpolation. It actually comes from a philosopher named Louis Althusser. And the point here, but she, she makes the point, she doesn't use the word, but she makes this point. She says, even if you do not want to be a part of a group into which you are thrown, um, you may well be compelled to be part, part of that group based on how other people see you. The example that Young uses, which I think is a very good one, is um, she talks about Jews in Vichy, France. So Vichy, France was um, France when it was occupied by the Germans in the 1940s during the Second World War, right? So the Nazis occupied France and um, the Nazis were, you know, on their project of first discriminating against and then exterminating Jewish people among other groups. And there were a lot of Jews who'd grown up in, in France who didn't, weren't particularly attached to their Jewish identity. They were quite assimilated into the larger culture. They um, um, went to university with non-Jewish French people. They had professions alongside um, Christian French people. They were quite assimilated into the larger society. A lot of, especially the younger people, didn't particularly care about their Jewish identity or want to be affiliated with it. Um, it wasn't important to who they were for a lot of people. But then when the Nazis came in and occupied France, um, what do you think happened? The Jews were treated as Jews by the Nazis and they had no choice but to respond as Jews. Right. And so this is called interpolation. Althusser's um, explanation of this is he says, imagine you're walking down the street and a police officer yells, hey you. Maybe you ignore it and he says, hey you. And then you turn and you say me. And Althusser argues that you're being sort of interpolated as his word as a suspect or maybe even as a criminal, right? Even if you've done nothing, you can't help but respond to the summons of that police officer, which casts you into a certain kind of position. So imagine this with the Jews in France and the Nazis. The Nazis come in and say, and start treating you as a Jew and actually threatening you as a Jew. And you don't get to just opt out of that, right? That's part of your thrownness, even if you don't have any particular personal attachment to it, you have no choice but to respond as a Jew when someone's trying to persecute you or murder you, right? That's not a choice. So I have another example here of, um, you know, um, Jim Crow in the US South segregation, right? Um, you don't get to opt out of being seen as a second class citizen who cannot participate in the larger society. You have to respond to that in some way or another, right? If you're a member of um, the African-American group, right? So that's part of your thrownness. And it's interpolation, right? Discrimination is a powerful interpolator, right? Where you don't get to not be shaped by that or have some kind of response to that in some way or another. Okay. Why is this a good definition of groups? According to Young, she says, this is a good definition of group because it's not an essentialized definition of any one group identity. Remember our criticism of essentialization with Simone de Beauvoir, right? Where people are shaped um, by their experiences as members of group in certain ways, but then people act like the result of that habituation is actually the cause of their place in society. So if women are habituated to be inferior, the sexist will then say, see, women are naturally inferior. That's called essentialization or naturalization. Young wants to avoid that for reasons we've seen, right? Um, 
in her essay, Throwing Like a Girl, to name one example, right? Where she's very interested in habituation and how we become formed as subjects. So here she says, this is not an essentialized definition of groups. It doesn't say there's something essential to being black or essential to being a woman or essential to being a millennial or anything like that, right? Instead, she says, this is a social and relational conception of groups, right? Um, who Jewish people experience themselves to be is in many, many ways shaped by their social and historical experiences, say of being persecuted by the Nazis, right? Among other things. So it's not that there's something essential to being Jewish, there's something continuous and ongoing about being Jewish that is responsive to its place in social, political, historical situations. And that would be true of women too. We've seen women as a historical situation. It would be true of um, African-Americans. It would be true of any number, any group, any throne group, right? Is what it is in relationship to others in these historical situations, right? Um, this does, so these groups are very real, right? But we have to understand reality in terms of how things have become over time. So remember de Beauvoir, to be is to have become. Um, so one thing, I'll, I'll move on from this discussion in a minute, but one thing, a thought or a question I wanna leave you with is, um, you know, I've been focusing on issues of discrimination and oppression in a lot of ways, but Young also thinks that um, this is a positive sense of group, right? To understand them as thrown and social and relational. And so I'd like you to think about why. If you, first of all, if you agree with that, and second of all, why this is also a positive understanding of group identity, right? Why is it desirable to be part of groups, including groups we did not choose into which we are thrown, right? So what do you think about that? I'll give you a couple of things to think about and then I'll move on. One is you could think, in what ways are your group identities positive and affirming parts of your lives, including group identities you didn't choose, right? Why might you be proud of being black or of being part of the LGBTQ community or of being a woman, right? Um, I didn't choose to be a woman, here I am, and um, that might be a positive and affirming part of my identity, right? So. Think about that, why is that? How does that play out? Second, this is a second reason that Young gives is, um, group solidarity is crucial. It's very, very important for fighting against oppression. So if I'm a Jew in Vichy, France, right, who formerly wasn't attached to my Jewish identity at all, but now I have no choice but to respond to this discrimination as Jewish, I might actually find great power and meaning in uniting with other Jews to fight this kind of awful oppression to Jewish people and maybe to other groups too, right? And so group identity then can lead to group solidarity, which can be a very powerful thing, right? You can look at feminism that way too, right? Any kind of anti-oppressive, anti-racist kind of um, solidarity comes out of thrown identities and solidarity is sometimes across thrown identity. So you can think about that and how that works. Okay. So with these things in mind, um, we can get to sort of final major section of the essay, which is on Young's categorization of different forms or faces of oppression, pages 48 to 65. Um, there's five of them, obviously. So there's a section, um, on each, um, and I encourage you to work through those in detail. Um, your contemporary examples should be on one of the five faces of oppression, and so you should go into more detail and depth in your thinking about that and your explanation for why you choose the example you do than I will go in, this, on this, in on this lecture, okay? I'll just try to give you the main points of um, each of the faces of oppression, um, and then you can pursue that further by choosing one and finding an example of it. Right. And the important thing to remember here to link to what we were just saying about groups is that all of these kinds of oppression are not just experiences of individuals. They're experiences of individuals as members of groups, right? As members of throne groups, right? These are necessarily structural, systematic group ways of treating one another. 
right, that involve an oppressed group and a privileged group in each case. But the form of the oppression looks different. And Young identifies five differences. There might be more, but she thinks we can categorize pretty much a lot, you know, a lot, at least a lot of what we see in, say, the United States today or around, around the world in lots of ways into these um, five um, kinds of oppression. Okay, so I'll, I'll relatively briefly go through each and then encourage you to continue pursuing one, at least one of them. Okay. Um, Oh, one more thing I'll say before I go into each of them in detail is some groups can experience more than one of these forms of oppression, but it's interesting to be able to anal analytically distinguish what the nature of different forms of oppression are, even if one group experiences multiple forms of oppression. Okay, so let's get going. Exploitation. Exploitation is a technical concept comes from Karl Marx. Um, Karl Marx was very interested in economic exploitation, the exploitation of one class by another class. And the class that was exploited, he called the proletariat. We also call it the working class. And the class that, that was the exploiter, he called the bourgeoisie, which we can sometimes call the middle class, right? The bourgeoisie, um, or the upper middle class, people who owned capital, People who own capital um, own the means of production and laborers, the working class of the proletariat, have to work. They don't own things of their own. They have to work for wages, right? So um, let me briefly, very briefly tell you some of the details of Marxist theory um, and then you can get a sense of what exploitation is and then I'll tell you how Jung expands this concept um, beyond the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Okay, so think about the following. Um, back in the olden days, um, in feudal Europe, um, there were a lot of artisans. So there were things like cobblers and butchers and candlestick makers and things like that. And what, what those people did was they had some kind of special skill um, that they um, used and they could then sell the things they made um, for money. And they would then have apprentices often who they train in the special skill. So the blacksmith would have an apprentice who would learn how to be a blacksmith and he'd be the village blacksmith and so on, right? So um, I wanna think, use an example of a shoemaker. Um, say I'm an artisanal shoemaker in feudal Europe. Um, how long would it take me to make a pair of shoes? Um, let's imagine it would take me um, three days. And um, they're artistic, they're beautiful. I take pride in my craft. I learned how to do it from my guild master and I'm gonna be the guild master to a new apprentice and so on. And I, I take three days and I make this beautiful pair of shoes. Compare this to say I'm um, a capitalist in um, 19th century England and I own a shoe factory. Um, and I hire, instead of making the shoes myself, like the artisan in feudal Europe, I hire people, say 10 people, to each carry out a single function that goes into the process of making a pair of shoes. So I hire someone to stretch out the sole and someone to stitch the leather and someone to um, weave the shoelace and so on and so on and so forth. There's say 10 distinct tasks. And I hire 10 people to perform just these single tasks. Um, how many shoes can I make in um, a day. Um, who knows, but presumably a lot more than a third of a pair of shoes of just how long it took the artisan, right? It took him one, three days to make one pair of shoes. In um, the factory, let's say we can make 50 pairs of shoes a day. Could be a lot more than that, actually, right? These theories come from Adam Smith, a great kind of thinker of capitalism. He talked about a pin factory. He said, you probably make 10 times maybe more what um, the artisan can make, right? But what are the results of this? Um, A, no one knows how to make shoes. They just know these distinct tasks. So I can hire kind of whoever. This is what we call unskilled labor. And I can train them how to do this one particular thing. And then they can do it and they can do it pretty efficiently. But they don't know how to make a whole pair of shoes. And same with the worker beside her and the worker beside her and the worker beside her. We can imagine an assembly line of everyone doing a discrete thing. 
right? This was the great success of Ford Motor Company, the assembly line, right? Um, I can then sell these shoes on the marketplace as what Marx calls commodities. And we've got much greater productivity than the single artisan. We can sell way more. We can sell them for cheaper and uh, make a lot more money. So it sounds great, right? We've got greater productivity. We should all get richer than the artisan, right? Wrong, right? It's my factory. I invested the capital. I bought the materials. I set up the machines. You just work here and I pay you a wage for your time. How is this wage set? Not according to the profits I make. The wage is set, Marx argues, according to how much it takes to keep workers alive and allow them to reproduce to create the next generation of workers. This is what we call a minimum wage, right? That's what it's meant to do, right? Keep the worker alive, coming back to work and having a family. Right. And then, you know, exactly how much that costs varies. Um, but we need, you know, money for some basic education and, and so forth, um, money for some relaxation, things like that. But you're never going to get rich. You're never going to be rich as a wage earner. The only way you'd get rich is if you became a capitalist, if you could somehow own the means of production. But that'll never happen just from your wages. Right. Um, if you don't like this, I can say, well, you're free to go and get a job elsewhere. But at the other factories, they also just pay minimum wage. Right. And so we get this situation where I get richer and richer as the capitalist based on your labor and say, I get richer and I make a second factory. Right. Or I, you know, I, I buy more machinery that makes us even more efficient at making shoes. Your wages stay the same. I get richer and richer. This is what Marx calls exploitation, right? I am getting rich off of your labor. So in this cartoon here, we've got the capitalists sort of wringing out um, the working class for all their worth and discarding them, right? And they're wringing money out of them. So exploitation, the labor of workers goes to enrich capitalists. Um, that's the basic Marxist concept, and Young would agree with that. But she also thinks we can find exploitation going on in more ways than just the capitalists exploiting the proletariat or the working class. She says women are also exploited. What does she mean by that? She says women provide all sorts of labor that help men get wealthier. What kinds of labor? Housework, childcare, various kinds of emotional labor. It's a kind of um, term in feminist theory that's pretty interesting, where women um, tend to the emotional needs of men to a far greater degree than men tend to the emotional needs of women. Um, sexual labor, women tending to the sexual needs and desires of men, right? And so a lot of what's going on at home, Young argues, takes the form of exploitation, where men can develop personally and professionally and economically based on the labor of women that is exploited to enrich the men, not um, deployed to actually enrich the women. Young also says that racial minorities are very commonly exploited in liberal societies like the United States. They make up the disproportionate um, amount of the working class and they perform many of the undesirable jobs that other people don't want to do so that others may profit. You can see this often in um, the kind of racial hierarchies in many um, institutions. I was just thinking about um, my former grandparents nursing home. There would be the kind of lowest and most poorly paid workers um, were typically black. This was in Louisiana. The kind of nurses in the middle were often Hispanic and then the managers and so on were white, right? So the white, white people were the higher paid, the Hispanic, the middle and the black, the lowest, right? And the difficulty and um, 
challenge of the work actually increased going down, right? The lower the pay, the more undesirable the work, right? And this took distinctly racial lines. So it's not just economic exploitation, it's also kind of racial exploitation, right? And you can probably think of lots of examples like that. Okay. Um, marginalization. This is the second face of oppression that Young identifies. Um, so the basic point is this, if some people's work is exploited to support and enrich other people, some people are excluded from the economic situation altogether. Young writes, marginals are people the system of labor cannot or will not use. And she argues that marginalization is the most dangerous kind of oppression. As bad as exploitation is, marginalization is worse because it's people that aren't even counted as exploitable in the economic system. The example I have here on the screen is um, Mexican and Central American refugees currently locked up at the US border, including children, right? Um, these people aren't even exploited by the system. They're marginal to the system, right? That's often the plight of refugees, is to be marginals, right? People who do not count in society. And you should think about what is this like for these people? Imagine it's very horrible. And what happens to these people? What is their fate? Probably often very horrible as well, with a few exceptions. Okay. Okay, third, powerlessness. What is this? Even when people are employed, some people enjoy more power in their work and social lives than others. You could actually think back to my um, nursing home example. That is an example of exploitation that falls along racial lines and gendered lines. Actually, all those people were women, <laughs> or most of them at the nursing home. Um, but it's also the case that the more privileged people, the white working class women, enjoyed more power and prestige in the job. They could make more decisions, they could enjoy more respect, and so on, right? So you could also think that in your analyses of these five phases of oppression, some people can be privileged according to one face of oppression and oppressed according to another, right? So a white working class woman at the nursing home might be, um, definitely, well, is definitely exploited by Young's definition but she might enjoy more power and prestige by this third face of oppression's definition. So that's a complicated situation to find yourself in. And a lot of identities will, will be complicated in this kind of way, which can be problematic for identifying roots of solidarity among people, right? Also problematic for people recognizing that they do enjoy certain kinds of privileges, even if overall they don't, right? So these, these, this is what gets complicated about what we call intersectionality which I'll define more clearly next lecture. Um, so, but Young is probably more interested in, in a sort of professional class of people and the power they enjoy, which probably wouldn't include the women in the nursing home. Um, professional class, doctors, lawyers, teachers, and so on, right? Enjoy more autonomy and more respect than those who work in working class and menial jobs. Right. Young writes on page 57, this powerless status is perhaps best described negatively. The powerless lack the authority, status, and sense of self that professionals tend to have. This shows up in all aspects of social life, not just in the workplace. From how people speak and dress, to what kinds of activities they enjoy, what kinds of food they eat, and so on. So a couple, I'll point out a couple of more details of what Young says about this, and then I'll leave you to further investigation. One, she says, um, this can intersect in interesting ways with um, other forms of oppression. She gives an example of, um, say, um, a Puerto Rican woman that people assume has some kind of menial job, and when they find out she's a teacher, they start treating her with more respect. Right, um, or a working class man, white man, who's afforded certain kinds of respect for being a white man, when people find out he's got this blue collar job, they start treating him with less respect, right? So here status can take complicated intersectional forms. 
Second point, um, Jung brings up um, the issue of respectability. There's been a, a bunch of attention to this in feminist circles lately, respectability politics, it's called. And the idea there is that um, um, there's a certain, certain sorts of stereotypes and expectations of what a powerful and respectable person looks like. And when people don't meet that or fit into that, um, which is often visual, um, though it could also be about what, how you speak and things like that, then they're not taken seriously. This has been a big problem for um, African Americans um, who get discriminated against, say, based on their hairstyle. Um, they say that's not professional looking, that hairstyle, even if it's a perfectly um, ordinary kind of hairstyle for um, black women or men to um, wear. Or um, people get discriminated against for certain kinds of dialects or accents or ways of speaking that don't sound like the profession, they call it professional, but the respectable um, way of speaking, which would usually be associated with white middle-class people, right? And so even if a person, well, first of all, it might be harder for a person who doesn't fit that to get the jobs that would make them powerful and respectable, but even if they had it, they might continue to face certain kinds of discrimination and therefore um, experience a kind of powerlessness. Right, and that's that's the for, um, the um, third phase of oppression that Young identifies. Okay, fourth, cultural imperialism. This kind of oppression most closely resembles the kind of oppression we already saw with de Beauvoir and others um, in the in the last unit, but it greatly extends it. And the basic point here that Young makes is that one identity is thought to be neutral or normal. And that's the white Western well-off heterosexual man. We already saw this in the introduction to this lecture, right? This is just the normal representative of humanity. Other groups are on the one hand stereotyped according to very obvious um, cartoonish kind of cultural markers about who they are. And on the other hand, Young argues they're rendered invisible from the point of view of the dominant or the normal culture. She writes on pages 58 to 59. To experience cultural imperialism means to experience how the dominant meanings of a society render the particular perspective of one's own group invisible at the same time as they stereotype one's group and mark it as other. So this is an interesting claim. How can a group be both made invisible and stereotyped at the same time? Um, so I wanna give a, a brief explanation of that. A privileged group, say white men, are full of subtle differences, internal diversity and variation and so on. People are allowed to be individuals, right? Because they're not attached to skin color or um, a sexed identity, right? Um, this was de Beauvoir's point, right? She says, um, People, they're allowed to have disagreements and think things because they're true or false, not because they're men, right? So there's this wealth of diversity of um, opinion, interest, style, all these things because they're allowed to be full-fledged individuals, right? People from other groups can be denied that privilege, right? They can be treated as the, say, token Black person in the room, as if all Black experience were the same or they can be identified with certain overt racist cultural markers like happens to Native American people, right? Or they can be um, you know, um, dismissed as women, right? And so made to be the representative of a whole giant group of people, right? Um, so the point is other groups are identified with their group or with their culture in a way that the privileged group isn't. Katz actually made this point too in the film, right? He said, um, we don't think of white people as belonging to a race as often as we think of black people as belonging to a race. We don't think of men as belonging to a gender as often we think of women as belonging to a gender and so on. So um, the dominant culture is not seen as raced or gendered in the same way that minority or othered cultures are, right? And that's how they can be both stereotyped and rendered invisible at the same time. It's their individuality as persons are rendered invisible. They're covered over by the stereotypes of their group. Here's another example I thought of recently. Um, 
a few years ago, a white man um, shot up a concert in Las Vegas, a country music concert and killed 58 people. It's one of the worst mass shootings in US history. And people talked about him as a mentally disturbed individual and kind of plumbed into um, what his mental health background was, why this guy would do this horrible thing and so on. Um, and then the black writer, Sean King said, look at the white privilege enjoyed by this so-called lone wolf shooter, right? People are interested in his psychology and who he was as a person, right? Compare that to what happens when say, um, a Muslim person um, bombs a group of people or whatever, we just call them a terrorist, right? And we say it's because of their culture. And so individual psychology is sort of afforded to the dominant group it's denied the other group. They become the stereotype and we leave it at that, right? Or um, think about the different ways we often talk about alcoholism among white privileged men compared to say um, Native Americans on reservations, right? For the second, it's this sort of cultural stereotype. For the first, it's an individual problem that we probably throw lots of resources at trying to treat. So you can think about lots of examples like that. Okay, five, finally, the fifth phase of oppression, violence. Some groups are systematically subject to violence in a way that others are not. Women are more subject to violence than, um, well, women and certain groups of women are, are, are more subject to violence. Um, homosexuals, gays, um, LGBT people are more subject to violence, especially trans individuals, right? And um, African Americans are definitely more subject to police violence than white Americans. It is always individuals or groups of individuals who perpetrate violent acts. But it is a larger social context that tolerates it, right? Whose lives count to the larger society more, right? Are white lives worth more than black lives, right? Um, this is the point of Black Lives Matter, one of the main points of Black Lives Matter, right? Is to notice the ways in which Black lives are not valued in the way white lives are, right? And to object to that. Violence is not merely a personal issue, not merely a legal issue, but a political issue, right? This is why it's a, one of the faces of oppression, right? Um, people often are tempted to dismiss it as just a, um, an individual issue, right? That one bad apple cop, Right, rather than thinking about it as a systematic issue that oppresses whole groups of people. Okay, I will wrap up there. I look forward to your examples of different faces of oppression.